So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on the first day of our two part series, the story of your genetics. As we get right into our event, I want to remind everyone to select all panelists when typing questions into the chat or Q and a box. Uh, today, we are happy to have Dr. Mille with us to speak on DNA and your ancestry. Dr. Mille is a professor and department head at LSU School of Medicine, Department of Gen uh, Genetics. His profession has taken him all over the world, and today he is with us to present on DNA and your ancestry. Please welcome Dr. Mille. Thank you so much uh, for, for this kind introduction. It is indeed true that uh, my profession has taken me all over the world, and that is relevant to today's conversation, uh, as, as you will hear uh, in a second. So, what is ancestry? What can we learn from it, and why does it matter? Uh, advanced slides. So this is a painting. It's the last painting uh, that that Paul Gauguin uh, painted when he was uh, dying in Polynesia, uh, and it's meant to be his uh, grand view of the human condition. Up in the lower, uh, in the upper left corner, you see a uh, a little golden insect with three questions. Uh, these are, where do we come from, what are we, and where are we going? Uh, the answer to these questions is, is very related to uh, our genetics. So what exactly are we, and where do we come from? Well, we come from a complex interaction between our genes and our environment. Our environment selected the genes we have, and the genes we have, uh, by uh, affecting our behavior, make us alter the environment. Uh, ultimately, our phenotype, which means uh, our outward status, whether or not we have a disease, whether we respond to a medication, is the effect of a constant interplay between our genes and our environment. So where do we come from? We come from a very long evolutionary trail. Uh, remember, this is Charles Darwin, who said it's not the strongest species that survives. So survival of the fittest is actually uh, an oversimplification. Uh, nor the most intelligent, but the species most responsive to change. And our uh, uh, conditions have changed significantly throughout the history of humankind. Now, I, I give these time intervals in centuries because that gives us an immediate sense of what I'm talking about. Seven million years doesn't register, but if you think about what the world was like two centuries ago, really ancient, before the Civil War, you know, there was no running water in most houses, no electricity, no computers, uh, no cars. Well, it took 70,000 centuries uh, from the emergence of the first common ancestor of humans uh, until today. That's a very, very long time, if you can uh, envision how many centuries that is. Now, during that time, our genomes haven't really changed very much. Uh, the part of our genomes that produce uh, our proteins, which are the, the little machinery that runs our cells, uh, is only 1.2% different from that of the two main species of, of chimpanzee, uh, pantroglodytes, which is the, the, the aggressive, rather mean chimp, and pan paniscus, uh, which is the benevolent, friendly, and not aggressive chimp. 1.6% difference with gorillas, and uh, only 15% different from a mouse. Uh, the level of genetic variation uh, 
among different human beings, it's only 0.1% of our genomes. So the obvious question is, okay, then, so why do we bother with genomic medicine if we're really so similar to each other uh, genetically? Well, think of our genomes as computer code. Computer code is written in zeros and ones. Genetic code is written in four values, A, G, C, T. One human genome contains over 3 billion letters of code. So 0.1% of 3 billion is 3 million letters, not including other sources of variation, for example, variation in the length of repetitive region of our genome. So if each of these 3 million letters that can change can assume the values G, A, T, or C, there are 4 to the power of 3 million possible combinations. Now, each of us has two genomes, one from our mother and one from our father. So if you put all that together, there is a virtually infinite number of unique human genomes. Yes, we're similar to each other in the broad strokes, but there is a lot of variability among individual humans, and that affects uh, our likelihood of disease and how we respond to medications. Individual genomes can respond differently to environmental factors, which include disease agents and medications. Now, this is where ancestry starts coming in. Humans whose ancestors came from specific parts of the world share genetic features, that is, stretches of DNA sequence, and it's because they were shaped by the same selective forces uh, and therefore are more closely related. So that tells us that people who share a genetic ancestry were once exposed to the same uh, risk factors. For example, uh, my genetic ancestry is Italian, Greek, German, British, and French, no Scandinavian. So uh, I uh, am not prone to uh, genes that are more common in Scandinavians like cystic fibrosis, even though I could easily pass for Scandinavian for, for, from the way I look. Uh, uh, how do I know that? from analysis of my DNA in a way that I'm going to show you in a second. All right, so I want to remind you that genetics plays a role in most diseases. Other than, uh, and, and there are at least 3,000 disorders that are caused by mutations in a single gene, uh, but all diseases, except those caused by trauma, like accidents, uh, and, and gunshot wounds or stuff like that have some genetic components. Uh, genetic variation among individuals has been shown uh, to be associated with the risk of most uh, degenerative diseases like cancer, cardiovascular, diabetes, autoimmune disorders. That's a big one for reasons that I can get into if, if you have any questions. Neurologic, psychiatric disorders, efficacy of medications and adverse effects from medications. This is one of the biggest uh, uh, points in precision medicine. We want to be able to give medications uh, to which uh, patients are not going to have unexpected adverse events and they're going to respond uh, better. Again, another example from myself, I have high blood pressure. Uh, when I was first diagnosed, my, my colleague uh, put me on a medication that had a rare side effect. Uh, so uh, she changed my medication to something else that caused an even more rare side effect. It was so rare, she'd never heard of it. Uh, I, I did know of it and, and showed her the papers. Uh, and all of that is genetics. Uh, we finally found uh, uh, a combination of medications that work for me. And it turns out they're the same ones that work in my mother, uh, with, who is of course, uh, strongly genetically related to me. All right. 
So let's do some definitions. In a lot of epidemiology and clinical medicine, we use self-reported definitions like race and ethnicity or in the census. But these are subjective definitions. They don't really tell us very much on human biology. They can tell us on social de determinants of health, but not uh, about our likelihood of, of disease. Uh, what we call race and ethnicity are dynamic. Now this is verbatim from a two, 2021, so very recent guidelines on reporting race and ethnicity in medical research from JAMA. So it, it is a very authoritative uh, source uh, with which I agree wholeheartedly. Race and ethnicity are social constructs with limited utility in understanding medical research, practice, and policy. As I said earlier, uh, I would be defined as non-Hispanic white. That tells you absolutely nothing about what I may be predisposed to. Uh, whereas my ancestry, as I said earlier, is Italian, Greek, German, French, and British. So what is ancestry then? Humans whose ancestors came from specific parts of the world share genetic features. So ancestry refers to a person's country or region of origin, uh, and therefore that individual's lineage uh, of descent. So the question we're asking for ancestry is where does this person's DNA originally come from? Now, the vast majority of humans, with some exceptions like Iceland, uh, are genetically admixed meaning we don't just have one ancestry, we have a combination of ancestries. Uh, because uh, genes do move in human populations, people move, people intermarry and they exchange genes. So uh, almost no one has a single ancestry. Uh, and all of that can correlate with the risk of a number of diseases. So ancestry and genetic admixture uh, may provide much more useful information than social concepts like race and ethnicity about our health uh, uh, and our risk for disease. All right. So when we talk about medical genetics, we think as single uh, diseases that are caused by single genes, like cystic fibrosis, phenylketonuria, sickle cell disease. But in reality, most diseases uh, are affected by multiple genes. So there are studies called genome-wide association studies that correlate changes in DNA sequences at any position in the human genome with a clinical phenotype. Uh, and I'll tell you in a second what's the difference between a polymorphism and the mutation. These are essentially changes in the letters uh, in our DNA code. And they can occur anywhere in the genome, in the protein coding genome, but also in other parts of our gene. All right, so a mutation, and these are arbitrary definitions, a mutation is a change in DNA sequence, which is rare. The arbitrary cutoff is, it occurs in less than 1% of the population. A polymorphism is a change in DNA sequence, which is sufficiently common to occur in over 1% of the human population. You're going to hear this term a lot in the rest of the presentation. Single nucleotide polymorphisms that are often abbreviated as SNPs uh, distinguish individuals uh, of, of different ancestries from one another. So genomes that share ancestries share groups of SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms in their DNAs. So the way we actually find out about someone's ancestry is by analyzing not just one position in the genome, but many positions. Now, a little word of caution. The same change in DNA sequence can be a mutation for one human population and a polymorphism in another. For example, beta thalassemia, which is a, a blood disease that causes anemia, is much more common among populations who uh, are or were in the past 
uh, exposed to malaria because the carrier status for, for that variation protects from malaria. So it's a polymorphism in, in malaria regions, but it's a mutation uh, in, in, other, in other regions. Uh, a polygenic risk score is actually calculating, calculated by adding up the contribution of individual uh, variants to the risk of disease. We don't need to go into detail. I'll be happy to explain more uh, uh, in the Q&A session. So these are some real examples. Uh, this is a seminal paper where they looked at ancestry and the three colors here, green represent DNA that comes from Europe. Red is DNA that comes from Native America and purple is DNA that comes from Africa. Now, these patients are all identified as Hispanics. Well, that tells us very little or nothing about their genetics, because if you, if you can see the distribution of colors, there are at least, at least, six different genetic populations of Hispanics, which have ranges of mixtures of ancestry. I told you almost nobody has a single ancestry. Well, you have different mixtures with different doses of different components. So this matters a great deal more than uh, just saying somebody is Hispanic. Now, a little tidbit here, we don't need to go through the details of this box plot, but the amount of Native American DNA is higher uh, in women. Uh, why is that? Uh, it is because the conquistadores were mostly male. And so they brought their Y chromosomes from Europe, but the X chromosomes are still more commonly carrying genes from Native Americans. Now, why do we care about all this? Well, these different populations actually have different normal ranges of common clinical laboratory values uh, from vital capacity, which is your ability to exhale a, a volume of air, uh, the, the duration of their uh, uh, EKGs, uh, cholesterol, LDL, et cetera, et cetera. So if what is normal, quote unquote, for one ancestry is not normal for another. And so we need to adjust our interpretation of clinical values based on ancestry. This is an example from our own work. This is work that was done by uh, Silvia Serrano Gomez uh, and Giovanni Zavaleta in our, in our cancer center, uh, and I participated in this study. So we looked at a number of breast cancer patients in Colombia. So Colombia, all of these individuals define themselves as Hispanic. We measured ancestry, and as you can see, there is a huge variability from people that have almost no European DNA, that's the blue, uh, to people who have mostly European DNA, uh, uh, that's on the right side of the plot, and variable amounts of Native American DNA and African DNA. So there is a huge distribution of ancestries in this single Colombian population. Why do we care? Okay, so these are genes in the cancer now. We determined that uh, individuals with more Native American ancestry uh, activate these two red genes in their cancers more than people who have less Native American ancestry. And again, we saw it here. Why do we care? Well. These two genes are next to each other. So that means that that chunk of DNA is more active in tumors that occur in people with more Native American ancestry. IA stands for indigenous American. And it turns out that uh, these genes are a 
poor prognostic indicator, and, and they are also a therapeutic target because there are monoclonal antibodies that block RBB2. So these tumors, everything else being equal, have a higher risk of progression, and one could potentially treat them with a drug that affects this particular gene. So these things have practical consequences uh, on the tumors in these patients. All right, so how do we do this? You need DNA from blood or saliva, just as uh, participants in the All of Us program donate. Uh, and this contains uh, DNA in your blood cells or your saliva cells. Uh, as you know, we have two sets of 23 chromosomes. So DNA from chromosomes 1 to 22 is called autosomal. DNA from the Y chromosome tells us about our paternal ancestry, whereas DNA from the mitochondria, which are little organelles that live inside our cells, tells us about our maternal ancestry because we all get our mitochondria only from our mothers. That's why we know that all humans descend from a single woman, so-called mitochondrial Eve, who lived in Africa uh, between uh, 150 and 200,000 years ago. Then we measure SNPs, that is single nucleotide polymorphisms in this DNA, and we compare the distribution of SNPs found in that individual to large databases of genome that we know share common ancestry. This is how we do it in practice. This is a slide, and it's got a short segment of DNA that you can see here. Uh, these are letters. Uh, the G here is the site of a SNP. So this is a, a, an area that uh, can be variable. Now, you guys may remember uh, from the original discovery of Watson and Crick that DNA is a double helix. So this is one side of the helix. The other side needs to pair exactly with it. So T only pairs with A, C only pairs with G in order for the double helix to be stable. So we have these glass slides that have probes attached to them. And then we add, here's DNA from a certain subject, uh, which we have labeled with a fluorescent dye and broken it down into little pieces. And as you can see, it base pairs perfectly with the probe. Every A is lined up with a T, every G with a C, and this variable position pairs correctly with this person's DNA. So this person has a GC in that position. Another person may have a G instead of this C. Now, G and G don't pair with each other, so we have a mismatch. The mismatch destabilizes the double helix, so this is washed away. This is how we can tell what DNA contained a C from DNA that contained a G. I have a little video here that shows the process. It's about two minutes. The DNA is of course very long, but in addition to the extraction, it's cut. All your DNA is then placed in the so-called microarray. This microarray is inserted into a wound. A microarray has short pieces of DNA attached to an organ. They're called probes. The DNA string matches a probe, which bind together very strongly. The probes may not match your DNA. Using fluorescence, one can have the bound DNA emit light into the room. There are many variations on how to do that exactly, but generally it means that we can have this light. The light can then be read in a high-resolution digital camera 
and this way the script sample can be translated into this in some shape. Okay, so my little cartoon showed one chip with one probe. In reality, this is what the chips look like. And these are similar or nearly identical to the chips that are actually used by the All of Us program. There are hundreds of thousands and up to 2 million little probes attached to this one chip. And so it gives you a tremendous amount of information on SNPs that not only indicate ancestry, uh, but indicate our uh, uh, risk of diseases. This particular chip contains uh, 561,000 uh, common SNPs uh, and another approximately 100,000 that are, that are more rare. And as you can see, it can tell us about sequence variants that are likely benign, benign, likely pathogenic, meaning potentially associated with risk of disease or certainly associated with risk of disease. Uh, this is relatively inexpensive and the process takes uh, a limited amount of time. So you can get a lot of information from what we already know about which SNPs are associated with uh, uh, with what? Now, why is this important? I told you, and I'm going to repeat that again, that uh, our genes tell us how we handle medications, how we respond to them, how we metabolize to them. Uh, there is a whole discipline that's called pharmacogenomics, which is essentially telling us uh, how our genomes will respond to a certain class of drugs. So what are the challenges here? Now, this is a little technical. So uh, I'm going to keep it real simple. Uh, we don't know what all variants in human sequences do. So the more information we gather, the more we're going to be able to determine whether a certain variant of DNA sequence is in fact associated with risk. And that's one of the important deliverables of the All of Us initiative. But we still need a lot of basic science to figure out what each of these variable uh, uh, positions in our DNA do. Uh, and that is very data intensive. So this is computationally intensive. You need a lot of data and you need uh, innovative bioinformatics. And of course, uh, that means privacy concerns. So there is a need for encryption. Uh, whole genome data may be almost impossible to completely de identify, uh, and consent is needed uh, for all use of uh, personally identifiable information. Now, that's one reason why uh, all of us keeps the DNA in one place uh, and the clinical data in entirely another. Other challenges are, if we're going to apply these things in medicine, who needs what genetic tests? So we're going to need, going forward, more specialists in medical genetics, uh, which tells me that my colleagues and I are very unlikely to be out of jobs anytime soon. Uh, but also we do need to communicate very accurately what exactly do these results mean for each individual and their families. There is a very important profession, which is genetics counselors, whose job it is to determine the best genetic tests for each individual and to explain the results to patients and their families. Uh, as you all know, all of us is probably the largest medical data gathering effort in history. A part of all of us 
is gathering genetic data that give us information on ancestry. It's also environmental, clinical, lifestyle, uh, and, and behavioral data, all of which affect our risk of disease. Uh, we're going to be able, when this is all said and done, to estimate the relative impact of risk factors on individuals with different genetic profiles more accurately than ever, and to therefore deliver medicine that is more accurate than ever. So I've shown you all the challenges. Where are the opportunities? Well, with enough data, we can design evidence-based prevention policies uh, that target prevention uh, uh, policies to, the, uh, uh, to uh, the real risks faced by individual populations. We can improve the stratification of patients for treatment. Uh, for example, some patients have uh, mutations that make them more likely to respond uh, to immunotherapy. Not everybody responds to immunotherapy, and immunotherapy is really expensive. Uh, that allows us to optimize the use of healthcare resources and to also uh, optimize the design of clinical trials by only enrolling patients who are most likely uh, to respond. What are the risks? Of course, there are population and individual level risks from data hacking, uh, which is why uh, the, the all of us data are encrypted both in travel and at rest to a level that is actually much more severe than that of any hospital. Uh, there is risk of discrimination against persons with specific risk factors, particularly in an insurance uh, uh, healthcare system. There's risk of unethical use of information, uh, and there's risk of miscommunication between researchers, healthcare providers, communities, and policymakers, uh, which produces misperceptions among the public. We need to be extremely clear and transparent whenever we discuss this type of data. In conclusion, ancestry can be associated with genetic features that increase or, de or decrease our risk of specific diseases, our response to medications, and our risk of adverse events. Ancestry is a piece of the puzzle. It's part of the information that we can use to optimize prevention and treatment along with individual environmental and lifestyle factors. And I'm going to stop here uh, and thank you for your attention and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Mule, for that presentation. Uh, we will now open the chat to any questions. Um, and I think we have a couple that did come through. Uh, you spoke on the environmental impacts of DNA and do you know by chance the percent of the time that environmental factors affect our DNA? Uh, how is this discovered when looking at DNA and what, what identifiers say it is environmental? So that, that, that is a great question. There are two different ways uh, in which DNA can impact, uh, 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 the environment can impact our DNA. One is what we talked about today, which is actually causing changes in the sequence of letters in our DNA, causing mutations. Uh, these are readily determined uh, by tests that, that exist right now in the clinic that are based on, on DNA sequencing. You can calculate a total mutational load. However, there's a whole other way that the environment can affect our DNA without changing its letter sequence that is called epigenetics. And we don't have time to go into that. It would require a whole other talk. But and that, by the way, is the reason why my last slide was a musical score. Uh, when you play a musical instrument, you can play the same note loud or soft, long or short. Uh, there are chemical marks uh, that our cells use to tell their DNA, play this letter loud or play this letter soft. These chemical marks are useful because they allow us to tailor how our genes are 
activated or inactivated under certain conditions. For example, when it's cold out, uh, we make more uh, thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone uh, makes us hungrier uh, and it raises our temperature. Uh, cold and environmental variable affects how the genes that produce thyroid hormones are played. They are played louder. So environmental variables like uh, pollutants, but also diet uh, can change epigenetics. They can change how our cells play our DNA, even though the DNA sequence itself is not changed. And that is a huge field. Uh, you can look at things like DNA methylation. You can look at histone methylation and acetylation. We have the technology, in other words, to figure out how the environment changes, how well our DNA is played. Uh, and that is actually doable uh, with, with uh, the types of samples that we use in all of us. Excellent. Uh, another question, what is known about the genetics involved with red hair? There is apparently some evidence regarding response to anesthesia and with some diseases. Okay, so uh, that is an example of association. So red hair isn't by itself uh, responsible for uh, responses to medications, uh, but that is actually potentially a good example of ancestry uh, because red hair is much more common in certain ancestry groups than others. And it means that these groups also carry genes that affect our response to these drugs. Okay. Now, in terms of anesthesia, actually, one thing I wanted to add mm -hmm. is a much more rare uh, mutation that affects uh, uh, the likelihood of something called malignant hyperthermia. Uh, which is a potentially fatal complication of anesthesia. People carrying that mutation are at risk of death uh, if they're not promptly treated uh, uh, when they develop this complication and they need to know about it. And this is one of the return of value uh, that the All of Us program gives you. It's one of 59 genes that the American College of Medical Genetics deems reportable. Uh, anyone who has that mutation that puts you at risk for this particularly grave complication of anesthesia uh, will actually be notified of that. Great. We have uh, an attendee wondering if chromosome abnormalities in breast cancer play any part in people from Europe. Okay, so uh, chromosomal abnormalities play roles in all cats because cancers result from damaged genes. Uh, and the process is identical in people from anywhere. However, uh, there are differences in how well different ancestral groups repair their DNA. Now, DNA is this humongously long stretch of code of G, A, C, T, broken down into files that are the chromosomes, okay? Now, DNA is constantly damaged uh, by radiation, uh, by oxygen, by inflammation. Uh, so it needs to be fixed. And so we have DNA repair machinery that are themselves genetically encoded. Uh, for example, uh, the BRCA1 genes uh, that, when inactivated, strongly predisposes to breast cancer is particularly common in certain ancestry groups uh, uh, that originally descended uh, from Ashkenazi Jews. That doesn't mean that gene doesn't exist in other ancestries, but it's much less common. 
that gene increases your risk of breast cancer uh, by a very large extent. Uh, you basically have a, a lifetime risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer, which is almost one when you carry pathogenic mutations in BRCA1. Uh, not all populations have it. So that is, uh, some ancestral groups are more at risk of certain cancers because they carry uh, mutations or polymorphisms that make them less able to repair their DNA. So once they are subjected to mutagenic insults from the environment, they are more likely to develop cancers. All right. Uh, you spoke about how race and ethnicity are social constructs with limited use in the medical field. Since this information is collected in many places, what are examples of where this data could be used or applied? Ah, that's a great example. So what this kind of information tells you is more how people perceive themselves uh, and uh, what their likely uh, living conditions may be uh, in terms of diet and environment than uh, um, than anything biologic. I'll give you an example from our own work. Uh, we looked at uh, a type of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer. Uh, and we looked in Louisiana uh, among cases, uh, and of course we didn't have ancestry. Uh, all we had was self-reported race and ethnicity. We limited that study to African American and Caucasian because we didn't have enough Hispanics in that data set, uh, which is why for the other study we went to Colombia. Uh, what we found is two things. Individuals self identifying as African Americans have a 2.2 fold higher risk of developing that particular type of breast cancer. Now, that doesn't have to be genetic and it doesn't have to be ancestry. It can simply be due to the fact that these folks may have living conditions that put them uh, at risk of more mutagens. It could be genetic, but we don't know that for sure, and we won't know until we study their normal DNA. But then we looked at the risk of dying. The risk of dying of this disease was not related to self-reported ancestry, I'm sorry, self-reported race at all. It was related to the socioeconomics of where people live. So, uh, uh, and as it turns out, there was a great disparity. Uh, while there was overlap, the majority of people living under very disadvantaged conditions were Black. So, Self-reported black race was actually a surrogate for lower socioeconomic status, uh, which is the real factor in the mortality from uh, uh, from triple negative breast cancer in that population. Excellent. And we have one more question. Uh, why is Finnish ancestry separated from Northern European? That is a great question, and it's because Finnish ancestry is actually Central Asian. Uh, so it's closer to Turks, which is why that group, both genetically and linguistically, is called Finno Ugric, uh, which includes Hungarian, Finns, and Turks. So here's what happened uh, the area that is today Turkey uh, was inhabited by the first Caucasians. Uh, because the Caucasus are the mountains in Anatolia. Uh, this population migrated north uh, to populate Hungary and Finland, uh, which is why uh, there's actually the Turkish language and the Finnish language have similarities that do not extend to Germanic languages like Danish, for example, or, or Swedish. Uh, Later on, uh, 
individuals from Central Asia, from Turkmenistan, today's Turkmenistan, migrated into mm -hmm. Anatolia, taking their DNA with them. Uh, and uh, they migrated because the uh, Arab Empire uh, that had its capital in Baghdad uh, recruited them as soldiers. Uh, and what ended up happening is that uh, these Turkmenistan folks uh, were very good soldiers. Uh, and so once the entire military of the Arab Empire was made up of Turkmenistan people, they took over and they became the Ottoman Empire. So if you want to find similarities genetically uh, to Finns, you're going to look in Hungary and you're going to look in Turkey, but you're not going to look in neighboring Scandinavian countries. And again, Scandinavian is different from Germanic, even though the languages have similarities. For example, I have Germanic uh, um, ancestry. As a matter of fact, my last name, everybody thinks it's Italian, it's actually German. Uh, and it's, uh, it doesn't exist in French and Spanish that are Romance languages. So when I, I did my genetic study in Germany, uh, it's a famous brand of appliances in Germany. So whenever people ask me, What's my last name? I would say VD wash machine and like your washing machine. <laughs> so, and so, but I have zero Scandinavian DNA. Why is that? So, Europe was colonized by uh, different waves of people. The first Europeans were black uh, and they had blue eyes. Uh, and uh, you can find traces of them all the way up to England. Um, what we call whites actually came from the Caucasus uh, before the Turks moved in. <laughs> they came and from Iran uh, and Iraq. So the original white people are actually what, from what we call the Middle East. Uh, and they moved up to Scandinavia. So if you uh, talk to my Swedish friend from the Nobel Prize Academy. He is redheaded with brown eyes. These people had brown eyes. Then they eventually intermarried with Germanic people, and you had all kinds of variations, you know, with red, 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 red hair and blue eyes, black hair and white eye and, and blue eyes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Incidentally. There is a single locus that controls blue eyes and all humans with blue eyes have a single ancestor uh, who was an African. Amazing. Well, we have ran out of time for questions. Uh, Dr. Mule, on behalf of everyone, uh, I just want to thank you for your time. Um, your presentation was fantastic. And I know, again, we all just appreciate you being here. It was a pleasure. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure. If there are additional questions, please feel free to email them to me and I'll be happy to answer. Yes. Any additional questions, we will uh, relay those on to Dr. Mule. Uh, like we had listed in the first uh, slide, we will be going over a brief uh, presentation of the All of Us Research Program. Following that, we have a prize drawing, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, if it's okay, I'm going to drop off because I have another meeting in 10 minutes, so I'll be preparing for that. But as I said, ready to answer any additional questions. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mule. You're most welcome. Bye. All right, so I will pull up the All of Us Research Program slides quick. Okay, so I, I wanna thank Dr. Mille again um, for taking time to present on DNA and ancestry Briefly, I'd like to just kind of give an overview of the All of Us Research Program. 
So the Alvis Research Program is a nationally funded uh, is nationally funded by the National Institutes of Health, uh, and the program is focused on accelerating health research by taking a look at people's lifestyles, their environments. I'm having just a hard time transitioning to the next slide. I apologize. There we go. Apologies. Um, so, like I said, it's taking a look at people's lifestyles, their environments, socioeconomics, and biological makeup. The technical term is what's called precision medicine, and a large factor of this is enhancing individualized treatment. Uh, as a healthcare system, we do this already, but a goal of the program is to really improve this in order to help physicians and healthcare providers provide personalized care. All of us hopes to enroll 1 million or more people within the United States. And Marshfield Clinic is one of many healthcare provider organizations that make up this program. So, a very unique thing about this program is that it gives the chance for people to represent themselves, their culture, diversity, and community. Historically, research was not the most inclusive thing, and a highlight of this program is inclusivity amongst all cultures. It gets people involved with their health, which helps everyone, especially providers, when taking care of their patients. For providers, it enables them to have more personalized information about the patient as a whole and gives them the upper hand to deliver the right treatment the first time, saving time and cost. For researchers, one of the most costly and time consuming factors of research is the actual recruitment needed to conduct research. This program allows researchers to already have their cohort in a fraction of the time, saving money and really saving lives because you think the time to deliver new research is shortened. Something I hear so often is this is something we should have been doing a long time ago. And uh, I agree. However, something we all can confirm is we have the technology to do some of the things we weren't able to do even five years ago. People are more aware and they care more about their health. And a good example of this is the watches we wear, um, like a Fitbit. Most tell us our caloric intake, our steps, and so much more regarding our health because we care about it. And so on that first slide, I talked about the different factors the All of Us Research Program takes a look at. And on this specific chart, it goes into a little more detail. There are things like a zip code, and zip codes have a lot to do with our environmental health. It can determine our water quality, our air quality, and many other factors that maybe sometimes we don't think of as often. Our environment is just one essential piece of the puzzle to our health. And there are other factors with more specifics, such as social factors like our upbringing, our education, biological, like our genomics, and behavioral, like our daily routines. And within the program, there are a few steps to getting en enrolled. Initially, we ask for consent to be part of the program. And with this consent, it includes the authorization to share your electronic health record uh, and to receive DNA results. After this, there are surveys you can take. And once those initial steps are completed, you may be invited in for physical measurements and bio samples such as height, weight, blood samples, and urine samples. There is an additional option to attach your Fitbit, like I said before, to your account uh, to help track your health information, but this is also a ongoing process and something that is still uh, being updated as time goes on. And when you enroll, you go through all this work, right? Nobody likes to sit through surveys, uh, but I promise what you get in return is very beneficial. You can find out your ancestry, you can receive genetic information that may inform you about different, uh, excuse me, different preferences, risks, benefits to your own health, and much, much more that we may touch on in our next virtual event, which is uh, this upcoming Monday. One of the last, uh, but most important pieces to this presentation is privacy and security. You give access to your EHR, which can sound like a risk to most people, and rightfully so, but I can assure that every particle of data is de-identified and given an unanimous code that is not traced back to any name or personal data. Researchers have to complete an extensive code of conduct, and there are also there is also a certificate of confidentiality that the program works under. Privacy and security is one of our main priorities that we take very serious, and there's a heavy emphasis on the very. And a quick reference to the first slide as well. Uh, this is a national program, like I mentioned. 
You don't have to be part of a specific healthcare system to join, and you don't have to be a patient of a specific healthcare system to enroll within that healthcare system. A benefit of this is we all experienced first, we all experienced uh, firsthand today, actually, Dr. Miele is part of the All of Us Southern Network. Um, it's kind of that central right uh, area of the screen. Um, and uh, LSU Health is part of that All of Us Southern Network. Um, and a wide network like this gives us the opportunity to share valuable information through amazing presentations like Dr. Miele's. And to conclude, uh, I just wanna thank you all for sticking around during this presentation. Feel free to follow our social media accounts. This is where we post virtual events, videos, and other information such as today. So go and check that out. And if you have any questions regarding this, this presentation, the program in general, um, please email the email provided uh, right on the screen on the slide. Um, as we are running a little bit out of time, so I'd, I'd like to announce the winner of our raffle drawing because for those that stuck around, uh, I'm sure that's what everyone's waiting for. Um, so real quick, I'm gonna finish sharing my screen. All right. So I'm going to draw a random registration number um, from those participating. And Rhonda B, you are the winner today of our raffle. Uh, we will reach out to you by email to claim your prize. Uh, thank you for participating. And real quick again, thank you all so much for registering. Uh, this means so much to us. We put these virtual events together. Um, this is the first part of our two-part series. Uh, next Monday at noon Central Daylight Time, we continue the story of your genetics. Thank you so much.